Our presentation today is entitled, The Feasts of the Bible Are Shadow Pictures of Good Things to Come. Yeshua said in John 8.32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The question, of course, is free from what? Free from organized religion, the doctrines and commandments of men. Many have the mistaken belief that what is found in the Old Testament is obsolete, old and no longer binding for today's generation. This misunderstanding completely loses sight of the covenant Yahweh made with Israel and still makes with the spiritual Israel of today. The Old Testament's promises are also part of the New Testament promises. They are not two different and separate religious requirements, one for the Jews and one for the so-called Christians. The moon was made for the Modims, the feast days, to announce his special appointments with the people he had created. Like a mighty timepiece in the sky, he set up these beacons to tell us when it was day and night, to mark the passing of years, as well as to tell us when we were to meet with him for a special appointment. It states in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, Let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years and religious festivals begin. That is from the GNB translation, Good News Bible. Here's the King James versions. This is being confirmed in Psalm 104 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. That's the Hebrew number 4150, Moetz, which is feasts. If we like it or not, that is scripture. Yahweh made the feast days, they are his, they belong to him. The question is, what is the purpose and for what reason were they made? The term feasts in Hebrew literally means appointed times. These feasts reveal to us a special story. They are often called holy convocations, translated rehearsal, and are intended to be a time of meeting between Yahweh, the Creator, and men for holy purposes. Since these seven feasts of Yahweh are appointed times for set-apart purposes, they carry with them great sacredness and solemnity. Yahweh's appointed festival celebrations were designed for various purposes. Number one, to bring us closer to our Creator by meeting with Him at His appointed times. Number two, to be memorials. Number three, they are a sign between Yahweh and his people. Number four, they are a compacted prophecy of the plan of salvation. And number five, they prophesy future events. Feasts are first and foremost the Creator's appointments to meet with his people. This is what Yahweh states in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 4. Proclaim the following festivals at the appointed times. That's from the uh, Good News Bible. Think of it, the creator of the universe wants to meet with you and with me on specific fixed dates. He is the one inviting us. He made the appointment according 
to his calendar. We are not inviting him. Yahweh established holy days for these gatherings. Why would anyone be so disinterested not to accept this invitation to meet with the life giver? We need the benefits of those convocations. In Revelation 19.9 it states, Blessed are they which are called under the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Matthew 22, Yeshua told the parable starting with verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bitten to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bitten, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. Then in verse 5 of Matthew 22 it says, But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Because they were not interested. Yahweh's appointed feasts, weekly, monthly, or yearly, are designed to bring us closer to our Creator and Savior. We are to spend quality time with Him according to His schedule and according to His calendar. Furthermore, these yearly appointments, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, are also called memorials. Thirdly, the weekly Sabbath, the Torah, as well as the feast days, are assigned between Yahweh and His people. There are seven yearly feasts, which are seven events in the plan of salvation, that are important for us to understand. Seven feasts are seven events. The annual feast days are all about Yeshua, the Messiah. They portray in detail the seven great events in the plan of redemption and all have a final fulfillment. So weekly Sabbath, as well as the yearly feast days, are shadow pictures of good things to come. These feasts were appointed times of rehearsals for events that were to occur in the future. Paul provides the same conclusion when he refers to the feast as shadows of things to come in Colossians 2, 16-17. That is future. Question, what is the first feast we are to keep? You may be surprised, but according to Leviticus chapter 23, the weekly Sabbath is the first feast we are commanded to observe. For it states in Leviticus 23, 2-3, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, an holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. According to Exodus 20, 11, the Seventh-day Sabbath is a memorial of creation. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, verse 11. So a memorial of creation. The Sabbath, singular and plural, is our assign. For we read in Exodus 31, he stated, Verily my Sabbath, plural, ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Yahweh that doth sanctify you. That applies for all the Sabbath days, be the weekly or yearly. The next verse states, Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Is that serious? Is it a salvation or issue? We are to observe the weekly Sabbath from Sabbath dawn to Sunday dawn. This is called the Seventh Day Sabbath, spoken of in the Fourth Commandment and instituted in Eden. See Exodus 28 to 11, Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, Leviticus 23, 3, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and Hebrews 4, 4. In case you wonder why I say from Sabbath dawn to Sunday dawn instead of sundown to sundown, I recommend you check out my following presentation. When does a day begin? Do you really know? Does a day really start at night or as some like to say in the evening? Does the Sabbath really begin at evening, at the sunset moment, and continue to the next sunset, like we have been taught for so many years? Check it out for yourself, using scripture and history only, and you may be surprised. Let's go back to our presentation, The Feasts of the Bible Are Shadow Pictures of Good Things to Come. Is there a first Advent fulfillment for the weekly Sabbath? Yeshua declared himself master of the Sabbath and thus set an example for his followers to observe the Sabbath as he did. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Matthew 12.8, also 1 John 2.6 and Luke 4.16. Yeshua kept the weekly Sabbath without question. Is there a second future fulfillment? Isaiah 66 verse 23 says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, said Yahweh. This is a future fulfillment and will take place on the new earth. What about Revelation 26? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, what about the seven yearly feasts of Yahweh? First, we have the spring feasts. The Passover, the death of Messiah, the unleavened bread, his burial, 
the wave sheaf, first fruits, his resurrection, and Pentecost, his anointing as priest, king, and prophet. The spring feasts inaugurate Messiah's redemptive ministry with Passover, which is a feast of our redemption, the sacrifice of Yeshua at the torture stake as our paschal lamb according to 1 Corinthians 5 7 at Passover is the foundation and beginning of Messiah's redemptive ministry. The Passover, the time of the barley harvest, the first festival of the year was a memorial of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. The Passover is to be kept on the 14th day of the first month, the month of Nisan, of Yahweh's calendar. See Leviticus 23.5 and Exodus 12.26-27. The Passover was also typical, looking forward to the death of Messiah, the delivery from the slavery of sin, justification. That is the first fulfillment. Here are Paul's words confirming that. 1 Corinthians 5 7 For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Then Passover points to the final delivery of his people at the second coming when he will eat the Passover meal with them in heaven. According to Luke twenty two fifteen to 16 And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. The next feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is also a memorial of their leaving Egypt. We read in Exodus 12:17, And ye shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in this self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generation by an ordinance. And the ordinance is number 2708 and is a statute forever. Leaven represents sin, which must be removed from our homes and hearts. That is called sanctification. Leaven also represents false teachings. The first fulfillment represents Yeshua, who was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, without sin, and lived without sin. The second fulfillment is when the saints will be raised incorruptible without sin at the second coming of the Messiah. The third feast is the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits was an acknowledgement that everything belongs to Yahweh and comes from Him. He is the owner. Proverbs 3.10 states, Honor Yahweh with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. The first fruits were always dedicated to him, the giver of all gifts, and they should always be dedicated to him. The first fulfillment was the resurrection of Yeshua, who is a real first fruit. This is being verified by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.20. But now is Messiah risen from the dead, 
and become the first fruits of them that slept. The second fulfillment points to his second coming, when the 144,000 are chosen, the first fruits of all the living. Revelation 14.4 says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. This must be talking about the 144,000. Next is the Feast of Pentecost. The crowning of Messiah's paschal sacrifice occurred at Pentecost, when he was officially enthroned at the right hand of Yah. Acts 2.32 and Revelation 5.9-12 and began his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary on behalf of believers on earth. Yah exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. See Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Pentecost, also called the Feast of Weeks during the time of wheat harvest, is a memorial of the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. The first advent fulfillment took place when Yeshua was anointed as prophet, priest and king and when the early rain was falling on his first disciples at Pentecost. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain, and it is for this added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. The final fulfillment will be near the close of earth's harvest. In Zechariah 10.1 or Joel 2.23, it says, Yahweh shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. He will cause to come down the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. We are told in Joel 2.28, And it shall come to pass afterwards, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Now we come to the Autumn Feasts. We have the Feast of Trumpets, the last message of mercy. We have the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment. And we have the Feast of Tabernacles, that's the second advent, travel to heaven. The three fall feasts of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles typify the three steps leading to the consummation of Messiah's redemptive ministry, repentance, cleansing, and rejoicing for the final restoration. The Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. The Feast of Trumpets was a warning that announced the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment and to remind the people to search their hearts and to afflict their souls during the next ten days. The first fulfillment was the announcement of the birth of the Messiah by angels to the shepherds. It states in Matthew 12.10 of the wise men coming from the east, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. See also Mark 1.3, Luke 1.42, Luke 2.13, 1 
14 and 20 and John 1 15 and verse 23. John 1 29 pointed out the Messiah. The next day John sees Yeshua coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Feast of Trumpets represents Yahweh's last call to repentance. There were only ten days until the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, called the Days of Awe, to prepare for that day. The days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement are called the Days of Awe. The Days of Awe are devoted to self-examination and repentance from one's sin and preparation for judgment on the Day of Atonement. In Jewish eschatology, the days of awe are representative of a day of trouble. See Jeremiah 30 verse 6. That is to come upon the earth before the second coming of the Messiah. This day of trouble is also referred to as the birth pangs of the Messiah. That time of trouble is commonly called the tribulation. During that time of trouble on earth, Yahweh will protect his pride. According to Psalm 27, 5, For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. The Day of Atonement This day is known as Yom Kippur. It is the holiest day of the year. It was a day of cleansing and purification. On this day the accumulated sins of Yah's people were cleansed from the earthly sanctuary. Atonement involves individual as well as collective purification. It is a day of cleansing from sin, the climax of ten days of repentance and returning to Yahweh, and it culminated in the dispatch into the desert of the scapegoat to which the collective sins of Israel had been previously transferred. The scapegoat symbolically bore the sins of the nation of Israel away from the people. It was led into the wilderness and was pushed from a cliff to ensure that it did not inadvertently carry the sins back into the city. Fulfillment. The Day of Atonement will find its final fulfillment when Yeshua physically returns to the earth to judge and cleanse his people. The Bible clearly states Yeshua will return immediately after the Great Tribulation according to Mark 13 24 to 26. But in those days after that tribulation the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The Feast of Tabernacles The Feast of Tabernacles, the time of the fruit harvest, reminds us of the wandering through the wilderness and living in tabernacles. This feast is celebrated by a full week of rejoicing, dancing, singing and feasting and is called Season of Our Joy. The first fulfillment was at Messiah's first advent. He tabernacled among us, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, preaching liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to them 
that are bound. Isaiah 62 verse 1 The final fulfillment, this feast points to the second coming of Messiah, the last ingathering or harvest of his children, and the destruction of the wicked, as well as the trip of the redeemed to heaven. The last great day, Shimini Ataret. Shimini Ataret, meaning the eighth day of assembly, is a biblical Jewish holiday that follows the Jewish festival of Sukkot on the 22nd day of the seventh month. It is written, on the eighth day you should hold a solemn gathering, you shall not work at your occupation. Numbers 29.35 Shimini Ataret falls immediately after the holy day of Sukkot, although its name implies that it is part of Sukkot. Shimini means eighth, hence implying that the holiday is the eighth day of Sukkot. Shimini Ataret is actually considered a separate holiday. Yeshua's First Fulfillment in the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John seven, thirty seven and thirty eight. The second fulfillment is when we enter heaven. Yahweh will also begin this earth anew by recreating it at the beginning of the eighth millennium. The last great day is the eighth day or the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle. The whole feast and especially the eighth day represents a new beginning. The first day the redeemed will enter heaven in order to take part at the supper of the Lamb. In scripture, the number eight means new beginnings. As seven represents the day of completion, then eight, which follows seven, means over and above perfect completion or the first of a new series. Numbers and scripture by E. W. Bollinger, page 196. The Hebrew word for eight is shemone. This word taken from the root shaman means to nourish to fullness and is dominantly translated as oil, particularly the anointing oil. The priesthood was sanctified in seven days and presented to Yahweh on the eighth day when they began their ministry. See Leviticus 8.33 and chapter 9 verse 1. The Creator also revealed His glory on the eighth day. See Leviticus 9, 23-24. Yesterday the priesthood was of Levi. Today it is of Melchizedek. Revelation 26 reveals that the overcomer will be priest of Yahweh. The firstborn was given to Yahweh on the eighth day. See Exodus 22, 29-30. The eighth day signified a renewed beginning. This can also be seen in the musical scale. There are seven whole notes in music. The eighth note begins a higher octave of the same seven notes. Yahweh began the world anew after the flood with eight people.
By the way, Noah's Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles on the seventeenth day of the seventh month. See Genesis 8.4 During the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, the priests were to sacrifice 70 bullocks, Numbers 29, 12 to 32, starting with 13, which means rebellion, bullocks to be sacrificed on the first day, decreasing to seven, which is a perfect completion on the last day. Only one bullock was to be sacrificed on the eighth day. Here is a list of the uh, sacrifices which were made during the Feast of Tabernacle. Like the first day, they uh, sacrificed 13 young bullets. On the second day, one less, 12. On the third day, 11. On the fourth day, 10. On the fifth day, 9. On the sixth day, 8. On the seventh day, 7. So we have a total of 70 young bullocks. Genesis 10 records the beginning of 70 nations descended from Noah. There are 70 appointed times that the Creator Himself has established to meet with His people. And there we have 52 weekly Sabbaths during the year. We have seven days of unleavened bread, one day of Pentecost, one day of trumpets, one day of atonement, seven days of tabernacles, and one day of the eighth day. So when you add these up, there are 70 times to assemble. Considering Yahweh's many commandments to keep his feasts, as well as patriarchs doing just that, what hinders us today to fulfill righteousness as well? Clearly, the only holidays in the Bible are those kept by Israel and by the Apostles and our Savior as well. All else is man-made. and an abomination. It is time for all people everywhere to be obedient to what Yahweh established for the good of His people. Get in line with the annual feasts of Yahweh and your understanding will multiply many times over. Take a break, spend time with me and prepare for my soon coming. It is a rehearsal and an opportunity to be sanctified and receive His blessings on His appointed time according to His calendar. Remember, it is His feast, not Jewish or Moses or any other person. So come to the feast. Yeshua told of a parable in Matthew 22, the verses 2 to 10, which says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king, which made a wedding feast for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Say to those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. All is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they disregarded it and went their way, this one to his field, that one to his trade. And the rest, having seized his servants, insulted and killed them.
But when the king heard he was wroth, and sent out his soldiers, destroyed those murderers, and set their city on fire. The judgment pronounced came upon the Jewish nation in the destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of the nation. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast indeed is ready, but they who were invited were not worthy. How few respond to the gracious invitation of heaven, even today. Our Savior is insulted when His messages are despised and His gracious, winning, liberal invitation is rejected. Therefore, go into the street corners and as many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. In Luke 14.21 it lists the same parable and when all the first invited guests were not interested in attending the feast and made all kinds of excuses, the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And when there still was room, he said in verse 23, Go out into highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Continuing in Matthew 22.10, it says, And those servants went out into the street corners, and gathered all whom they found, both wicked and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Come to the feast and join us, is my sincere prayer. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom.